Lord, can you hear me? I'm here fighting, pressing to remember what you said. But this onslaught of thoughts fills my head with dread and I need you. Like enemies encamped, shrouded in the dark, I can feel the fascination of too many temptations reaching for my heart. So I need you to hear me. For I know your ears are attentive to the righteous and I know that your ways are certain. Even when my worries would trample me to dust, still, I know you are good. Your hand is just. So come now, be the salvation for my sins. Help me to begin again, that you would mend this trend of hopelessness. God, deliver me in my brokenness. I can feel your presence, even now in the ugly, in the mess that has been made. You surround me with your benevolence. Yes, your love is on display, and I can see it. Carving roads through the struggles and the troubles, past temptations and devices that seek to choke me out. So come fear, come failure, come opposition or doubt. Jesus, you are my deliverance. Your grace is sufficient. Trusting you is my only way out. Now I turn my mind to dwell on your truth. Curate the condition of my heart to manifest joy. Be my living proof. Subdue the haters. Quell the voices inside. Transform me, Lord. Extinguish my pride. You've won the battle. I trust in your plans. Yes, God. I surrender all my worries, my woes, and my demands into your eternally capable hands. Actually, I'm pretty sure she did that on purpose. Because, um, see, we last week was Easter. If you guys weren't here, we had an amazing services for Easter. It's two us, two of the best services we've had for Easter in years. And I, I took it a point. I'm really tangled up in here. Um, uh, so I want to make a want to make a point that just to thank. Because normally, I don't mention people because I just there's so many people always doing things. But last week we just everything went great so um just to give you guys an, an idea of what it takes uh, first off kevin sweat leads our first impressions team he always does an amazing job and last week with the increase in attendance and everything else going on his team just right on through there like it always does um the children's ministry was way up because of easter and all the people there ashley romaine heads our children's ministry and she just handled it it was smooth as silk as far as far as i, as far as I could tell from this building um then in, the, in this building, uh, Kathleen, who you just saw, leads our tech ministry, and tech ministry is doing their jobs if you never notice them. So if something goes wrong, you notice it, like my battery dies, you notice. But if, if they do a thing right, you don't ever know they're there. And last week, we, there were a lot of switches, a lot of things going on, and they all were smooth. And Sammy O&B runs our, leads our worship, worship ministry, the, the singers and the, the musicians, and they stepped it up last week. It they, they was spectacular, and everybody did a great job there. And then to get people here, we had our social media team with Nicole McGee leading that, and she had that 
everybody just stepped up, and it was spectacular. I just wanted to th take a second and thank everybody before we get talking about 21 days of prayer. So thanks to everybody who made last week really awesome. So. And today we're starting one of my favorite things that we do every year, and it's 21 days of prayer. And if you were to go around and ask Christians of every level, people who have been a Christian for like 30 sort of seconds, people who have been a Christian for 30-some years, what, do you, what are you least comfortable with when it comes to Christianity, to your faith? The two answers you would get overwhelmingly the most often are, number one, sharing my faith. People, people are almost always, most people are a little nervous, maybe a lot nervous about sharing their faith. And prayer. And prayer is like one of the foundational things in Christianity, but most Christians that I know don't think they do a very good job. I, I, I very rarely, if ever in my life, have run, ran into somebody who says, yeah, I'm really comfortable with my prayer life. I think I do well at that. It just doesn't happen. Most people, including me, struggle and are challenged in praying. And there, there are two or three reasons that get us off to bad starts when it comes to prayer. One of them is we've seen examples of what we think prayer is supposed to look like. We've seen somebody who did it right. And we can never feel like we live up to their standard. There may have been somebody, if you grew up in a church, there may have been somebody in your church, and man, that person just brought the house down when they prayed. And you just never feel like you're quite as good as they are. And sometimes, sometimes I think a lot of Christians will, will feel guilty for asking God for stuff. I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't bother God about that. That's, that's, not, that's not something I should bother God about. We feel guilty about it. And and, and we, we, just, we struggle with it. We, we have challenges, and we're not sure how to pray. We're not sure if we should pray. And sometimes people struggle like, well, if God already knows what I need, why do I need to ask? Why should I pester him for something he already knows? And so today we're going to be looking at a lot of that basic stuff in 21 Days of Prayer. This first session, we're just going to be talking about a lot of the basics of why we pray and how we pray. And we're going to read in Matthew chapter 6, and Jesus is going to address some of those concerns. Let's go ahead and just start reading. He starts out and he says, Jesus says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray... Do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now, we're going to work our way through some of those things, and I'm going to tell you right up front, these le the stuff we're going to talk about today is really deep. You're, this, you're just going to go, wow, a lot, okay? Cause these, so let me just tell you the first point. You're going to you're gonna have to process it a little bit. It's, it's a heavy, heavy thing. Um, the most important part of prayer is praying. The most important part of prayer is praying. And I say that because it's true. Because of the fact that sometimes we don't think we measure up, because of the fact that sometimes we feel guilty, sometimes we don't really understand the reason for it, because our lives are crazy busy, and there's so much interfering with everything in our lives, we don't pray. And if you're going to be good at prayer, you got to do it. I was watching, last night I watched a video of a basketball player that I like, and he was, they were talking to him, and he's, he's one of those guys who's an overachiever, you know, saying he's good, but he's much, much better than he really should have been if he was just normal. And the, the, the person was asking him questions, and she said, what's, what's the off-season look like for you? And he goes, I really don't have one. He goes, I don't like take a few weeks off or a month off because I practice all the time. I am constantly working on my craft. And then he started talking about, right before that actually, he was talking about a very, very, very famous player that if you know the NBA at all, you know this guy. And he was like, I played with him for just a few months, and I saw what he did when nobody was watching and how much work he put into it when nobody could see it. And the reason he's so good is because he puts the work in. And to be really honest, a lot of people, a lot of us aren't really good at praying because we don't 
bother to pray. We don't make a schedule for it. We don't make it happen. But notice Jesus, what did Jesus say? He said in that, what we just read, he said, when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray. And let me, let me, let me lay this out here for you too. I need you to stop feeling guilty or at least quit telling your faces you feel guilty. Because I'm looking out and people are going, you can look up. Like I said, I don't know very many people who consider themselves good at prayer. So when I hit you, I hit you with something, and you're like, oh, that's mine. Oh, the best way to fake it is to make it look like it. Oh, yeah, I understand that's for other people. But, okay, we're all, we all struggle here. But the most important thing to do in prayer is just to do it. Matter of fact, it, Paul said, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. What, what does that mean? Another deep thought. You will not pray consistently until you consistently plan to pray. It needs to be part of your schedule. If there is anything important in your life, do you schedule it? Everything that's important in my life, I schedule. If it really matters, it's a scheduled thing. Right? Everything that's important, I schedule. Is prayer important in your life? Schedule it. I know if you're a Christian, you're probably, you probably already say, oh, prayer is important, I want to do better at it. When do you do it? My, my life, but I have some flexibility. <laughs> this is how much the flexibility I have. Uh, because, I, you know, when you start a church, you're the one who first starts it, you can arrange things to go how you need them to go. Like, I'm not a morning person. If you didn't know that, I'm not a morning person. Extremely not a morning person. So our church doesn't have meetings before 10 o'clock. We have one Zoom meeting at 9. And that, that day, it's hard for me to get my quiet time in. That's pretty early. Yeah, it is. Start your own church. You'll like it. <laughs> no, it, but you know who you are. You know when you're strong. You know when you're good. Schedule yourself accordingly. Make it a priority. The more important it is, the better you prioritize it, the better you schedule it. If you say, prayer is going to be important in my life, when do you need to do it? Now, if you're a, like I do it for me first thing in the morning. I get up, get my breakfast, and, and pray, and read my Bible, and do my devotion, my time with God while I'm eating breakfast first thing every morning, okay? Some of you folks aren't morning people like me, and you got three kids that got to be in school at some ungodly hour, okay? And if you say, and if, you know, some people can pull this off, but I don't understand how, but if you say, I'm going to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and do my time with God, you better already be getting up at 4 in the morning. Okay, or 4.30. You don't try to suddenly, oh, I'm going to make myself a morning person so I can pray. If you're not a morning person, you're not a morning person. Okay, don't try to flick that switch. Some of you guys need to just say, you know what? Lunch would be a great time to spend with God. Okay, just find the, find the time, find the, the, the notch in your life where you can put it. I have, and I'm going to give you guys a lot of permission when we talk about this. Um, a couple times in my life, I have had a commute over an hour. When I was working regular jobs, I would drive an hour to work. And in both those situations, and those lasted for a long, a good while at both times, I did my prayer time while I was driving. God's not going, that doesn't count. I had some very good time with God praying in my car, driving down the road. It also makes you a better driver. It's really hard. And we thank you, God, for your majesty. Oh, what you doing? You know, you know it's, hard to, it's hard to do that. So you, you become a little bit better driver. But what works in your schedule? Schedule it. Make it happen. And then the other thing when it comes to just praying, there's no such thing as style points. Some of us feel like there's somebody off to the side. You know, you've got the Lithuanian judge and the Albanian judge and the Yugoslavia. There's not a Yugoslavia anymore, but the judge is holding up the card saying, oh, that was a good prayer job, good job. There's nobody judging you, okay? The only people who know what's going on are you and God, and God's not going to judge you for showing up, okay? Matter of fact, what did he say? Hypocrites love to pray standing in the synagogues and the street corners to be seen by others. What's the word hypocrites mean? What is, what is a hypocrite? Hypocrite is somebody who tries to be somebody they're not. 
That's where some of you got tripped up in prayer because you had that person who you just thought they prayed so wonderfully and you want to pray like them. And you're putting, you're, and all you're doing is imitating them and it's like, that doesn't work at all. Do you know who God wants to see when you're praying? You. Okay? He's not, he's not looking for some, you know, if, if you don't ever word, use the word thee or thou in regular conversation, why would you talk to God that way? Like you got to ramp up your language and do all these changes. and No. Hey, you're not fooling him. He knows what you're really like. He knows who you are. So just be you. Don't be a hypocrite. And, and sometimes, too, it, it, we'll hear stories about the, the, you know, the guys in the 1600s who got up and, at 4 in the morning and prayed for three hours before they started their day. We'll go, well, I, should, I probably, you know, I should do something like that. But here's what Jesus said. And I'm not saying those guys were bad. I'm, they were good. They were just different people in a different time. Do not keep on babbling like pagans. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Okay? God's not got a stopwatch going, mm, Steve came in a little short today. Hey, Steve, Steve, Steve didn't, Steve, he didn't, he didn't get it right today. I'm t- we're, we're, we're docking him points because he didn't pray long enough. I shouldn't tell you this. <clears throat> I am very concise in the way that I speak, the way that I write, the way that I communicate. I, I do things very concisely. I pray very concisely. For me, and some of this is going to shock some of you guys, and then some of you might fire me, my normal prayer time is in the morning, my first time of just praying, praying, because I'll read my Bible, and I'll do some devotional stuff, and then I'll pray my prayer list, and it'll take me about 10 minutes. Okay? I, it doesn't take me half an hour to go through my prayer list. Now, I then pray throughout the day, but again, every time I pray, it's rather brief. That's my, that's my personality. That's how I function. And so I pray as Steve, and Steve doesn't talk a long time, about, uh, except for Sunday mornings when I talk, you know, forever. But you'll notice I cover a lot of points because that's how I talk to God. So I've got a long prayer list, and it takes me about 10 minutes to work through that prayer list every day. And I am sure, I'm, I'm always afraid to tell pastors that because I'm sure they're judging me. You know, shouldn't you be doing like an hour and a half? I've tried. It turns into that. It turns into babbling, and I don't, wanna, I don't think God wants that. So, so don't be feeling guilty because you don't pray long enough. God's happy you show up, okay? He's not, he's not going, <sighs> maybe next time, right? So let, let, in, in the book... If you, did, if you haven't seen it, we, they're out in the lobby. Like I said, Barry, Barry said you can, you can download it on the app as well. And I'll put it on stuffstevesays.com tonight probably. If I get to, I'm assuming I get time. Um, if you go through the booklet, we're going to give you ways to pray. Because one of the things that can scare people is you don't know how. And all we're doing is giving you examples. Okay, We're saying this is a way people structure their prayer. Because I function better with a structure. I, I, like once a week, I will, tr- I will throw my structure out, and I'll just free talk to God, okay? And that's cool, but it's better for most people most of the time if you have a, an, an outline, okay? So we're going to give you three different outlines in the book so you can work through that, and that's both for new Christians, people who are just learning how to pray. It's also for people, you may have been praying for a long time and, and hit a dry patch. I hit a dry patch once in a while. I'll be, I'll be doing my time with God, and it'll start getting dry, and so I'll change something up, including the order the, that I pray for things. I change things all the time to keep it fresh, okay? And here's the one, we're, this week we're using this one. We're talking about this one in the booklet, and it has four words to it. First is adoration. Adoration means you start out by praising God for who He is. You lift Him up and exalt Him. That sort of gets you in the right perspective, okay? God's God, I'm not, then the next thing we do is confession. And that's asking God to forgive you for the wrong things you've done. Now, this may surprise some of you. I'm going to tell you a lot about how I do it. Not that I do it right, but it'll give you some ideas and some concepts. Okay, I'm not, I don't have prayer down pat, but you might, might free you up. When I have my prayer list that I have, my prayer list is actually on an app that I will show you guys during the this, during this series. Um, 
I have lists of things to, to adore God and praise God for. I start out my, my time with God by reading a psalm because that's worshiping God and lifting him up and getting myself in the right frame of mind. Confession, I have list in my prayer list the things that I am most susceptible to because I'm probably, I might forget. Like, I know, I'm sure I'm, not, I'm probably the only one here, but like some people, I know people, have trouble with pride and selfishness. Sure, nobody here has that, but if you do, I make sure I don't, I, I put it on the list to remind me to think about when was the last time this happened in my life so I can ask for confession for it. I also have a psalm that I use that says, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, as we go through here, and it's also in the book, um, where we're in psalm where it says, you know, search me, God, know my heart. See the anxious things in my heart. Find the sin in me. Show it to me. God, point out my sin so I can confess it to you. It's a very humble prayer, but God, where am I messing up? What am I doing wrong? Let me confess that to you. So I've got adoration where I put God where he needs to be. Then I've got confession where I put me where I need to be. And then the next piece is thanksgiving. And the thanksgiving part is where I go, okay, you're way up there and I'm down here, but still you do all these wonderful things for me. Thanksgiving is where God, you did this and you did this and you did this. It's a good thing to do. And finally, the last place, we use a big word, supplication, to complete the acronym, but it just means asking God. God, work in my world. Here's some ways I'm asking you to work in my world, okay? So that's, that's just an outline. It's not the only outline, but it's an outline. And if you're struggling to get started, go for it. It's in the book, in the booklet, and you've got it here, okay? Now, the second point is just as deep as the most important part of prayer is praying. And it's actually, believe it or not, this is an old... Um, Puritan saying, pray until you pray. Now, have you ever been in a conversation and you're pretty sure you're the only person in the conversation? Okay, who's actually in the conversation? Like, you're, you're, you're standing here and you're talking to this person and they're going, you know, they're watching TV, they're on the phone, you're over, talk, 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 on the phone, talk, 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 on the phone, talk, talk, talk. You ever been there? Yeah. Don't elbow your spouse. Come on, folks. And then you say something, and they go, I'm telling you, they're locked in and they're in the conversation. You know what I'm talking about? Most of the time when you start to pray, you're the one who's distracted. You don't start out connected with God. You don't start out praying, you're just reciting your prayers. I don't start out a lot of times praying, I'm just reciting my prayers. And it's very important that, and you may not bat a thousand, you're probably not going to bat a thousand on this, but your goal every time you meet with God is to actually connect with God. Pray until God has your attention. That's one reason I put my Bible reading and my devotional stuff before the prayer, because reading God's Word helps me connect with God. And so I'm asking, because I do some journaling, we've talked about that, we'll talk about that again when we do four weeks in the Word in the fall. But where you are in the Word for God to speak to you, so you're already focused on God, you're connected with God, and then you pray, and now you're praying and you're connected, you're in God's presence. Because prayer is meant to be an encounter with God. It's not, uh, it's not meant to be a, where you recite a list to Him. It is coming into His presence. And that's not natural, and it's not always easy. So that's the hardest part of prayer for most people, including me, is to make sure that when I'm praying, I am working my way into His presence, that I am aware of His presence, okay? Here's what Psalm 16 says. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. In God's presence, there is pleasure. There is joy. That, by the way, is the reason we do the music part before the teaching part on Sunday morning. It's because if it goes like it's supposed to in the lives of the people in the room, they're already connected with God. You're already connected with God by the time I start talking. And if you've already experienced God before I start talking, then you're much more open to what God wants to say through His Word to you. So that's why that's first, and that's why that, that's a, an important part of every worship service for us. And then the third thing is the battle of that guilt problem you have. The third point I want to make is don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. 
Anybody, don't raise your hands. Anybody ever feel guilty asking God for stuff? Do you ever feel like maybe the asking is the second rate portion of, the ser- of your prayer time? Asking is the, you know, there's the important stuff. There's adoration, praising God. That's the important stuff right there. And confessing my sins, that's so crucial because when I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And the thanksgiving, well, that's the high-level prayer stuff. And then there's that second, third, fourth tier stuff where I'm asking God for stuff. You ever feel like that? Maybe, maybe even feel guilty for bothering God with all, with all this petty stuff in your life? Well, how did he say it there? Jesus said, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. God knows before you ask, but He still wants you to ask. Okay? It is very clear. Here's what Philippians 4 says. Do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious, but in every situation, by prayer and petition. What does petition mean? Praying, asking. He uses the, the same concept twice. Prayer, petition, okay? With thanksgiving, present your request to God. In fact, somebody was telling me that they were in a situation where somebody's thinking that it was wrong to ask God stuff, ask God for stuff. He wants us to ask. And um, let me give you a, a few reasons why it's so important that you ask God for stuff. It's not second-rate prayer it's not second priority prayer. It is important and an important part of prayer. For one thing, praying teaches us dependence. It reminds us how dependent we are on God, how much we need Him for everything. How, how did Jesus start, at, well not start, but how does the, the Lord's Prayer go? Give us this day our daily bread. A reminder, how good am I without food? Now, different people have different ratings on that. I'm on the Steve needs food pretty often phase. You won't like me when I'm hungry. Okay? And, but I need food and I'm required to have it. It was, it was, it was really kind of cool. First service, my mic went out when I said this point. Oh yeah, Steve's kind of dependent on the whole, you know, electricity thing. We're dependent on so many things. And when we pray, we're putting that in God's, God's hands. We're reminding ourselves. A guy named D.A. Carson wrote an amazing book on prayer. I'll show you the title in just a second. Where he said, prayer reminds the believer that God is the source of all good and that all human beings are utterly dependent and stand in need of everything. The book is called Praying with Paul, and I would encourage you, if you're looking for something to read about prayer, that's an amazing book. I just finished it recently. And it is, I'm going to, matter of fact, all three of the points, I'm going to quote him in it. But we are dependent creatures who like to pretend to be independent creatures. We like to pretend that we don't need anybody. And we need God, and we need Him all the time. Okay? But more than just showing our dependence, prayers are a way for God to show love to us. Um, those of you who have kids or grandkids, excluding the aisles at Walmart, how do you feel when your kids ask you for stuff? You know, I'm not talking about, you know, <laughs> how do you feel at Christmas? Do you like giving your kids gifts at Christmas? Do you, do, do you remember that when, when your life clicked at some point, those of you who, pa- who passed that stage, and Christmas became more about giving gifts to your kids than getting gifts for yourself? Where it got to the point where if you had nothing to unwrap on Christmas morning, you'd have been perfectly fine with it as long as your kids. And the whole point, the whole point was what? The whole point was watching them unwrap it. Or you go to a birthday party for like your kid or your grandkid, and you've got a gift that you got them, and you're sitting there, and the only thing you want to happen is what? You're waiting for them to get to your gift. Right? Because that, that, that's, that's what you want. You want, to, you want them to open that present. So you're, you're going, hurry up, hurry up. I don't, I don't care what, no, who cares what grandma gave them? Oh, that's the wrong grandparent anyway. What about mine? Get to my gift. Hurry up to my gift. And you're watching the face and you're hoping for the, right? How does God describe himself to to us as relationship? Father. He always refers to himself as Father. 
And fathers like to give gifts to their kids. Carson said, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, not only because he is powerful, but also because he is generous. He loves to give good gifts to his children. I'll, some of us sometimes, I think, can feel guilty because God's given us so much, and we don't want to ask for much more. And understand that every good and perfect gift comes from above. I mean, not everybody here does that, but some of you live in some nice neighborhoods, and some of us live in nice houses. Some of us have good things. And if we're not careful as Christians, we can almost feel guilty about that. Now, if you're not using what God gives you to further his kingdom and to help other people, feel guilty. But if, if, you're, if you're acting as a channel and a conduit for what God blesses you with, God just likes to bless you. I, I remember this. You guys, I don't know if all of you, some of you guys be too young for this, and I hate this, but some of you missed the Sears catalog at Christmas. Okay, you, 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 this is, this is some, this is a, this is a, a gap in your life you're never going to get back. Because every year, October, November, somewhere in there, Sears would send out their catalog. And I think there were other things in it, but all I remember were there were toys in the Sears catalog. It was, I don't know, I can't remember at all, but it seemed like it was two-thirds toys. Okay, and mom and dad would, would give us the catalog and say, mark what you'd like. Tell us, give us some ideas. At least my parents did it that way. And I remember I was, th there comes, you know, you start out when you're just little and you don't know anything, but you, you reach an age where you understand your parents financially. My dad was a school teacher. Mom was a school teacher and a stay-at-home mom, and then she was a 4-H agent. She did various things. We were fine. We had good life. We weren't rich. I knew there was no reason to ask for the most expensive thing on any page. But I, I, I knew I'd have good stuff coming. And there was, um, there's no, I don't, I, I'm trying to work on how to politically correct tell you about this toy that we used to have that I don't think they make anymore. They made forts. They were like fold-up forts. And in the forts would be the two combatants. And, and in most of the cases, that meant it would be a frontier fort and there would be, you know, Union soldiers and there would be Native Americans. And, you, and, you, and, you'd, and you'd play with the fort. And, and I wanted one of those forts. I was exactly the right age where little toy soldiers were the greatest toy in the world. And they had these forts, and the forts had different numbers. And they went down the page. And at the top was the most expensive one. It was really expensive. And I knew my parents weren't in a position to get that one. At the bottom were the, the, the least expensive ones. And my parents, were, I, I knew I didn't need to go down there. But if there were five on the page, I picked number two or three, right? I said there were six on the page, I'd pick number two or three. And I, I checked it, put my name on it, just show, so they'd know it wasn't my little sister asking for it. And I remember because it was just naturally and easy to kind of memorize them. Kinda, you kind of learned all of them. Because you'd spend hours with that catalog. And I knew that page. And we're getting up on Christmas morning and going in. And I'd picked number three. And they got me number five. And it made me feel, wow. I guarantee it made them feel better than it made me feel. To see the look of surprise on my face when they bless me beyond what I thought I deserved or what I should expect. God is your loving Heavenly Father. He gives you good gifts to show that He loves you. Now sometimes as a good father, He knows to say no about something. Sometimes as a good father, He knows to say wait about something. But He always acts in your prayers as the loving Heavenly Father. Always. Every request you make of God, He responds. Ready? In the most loving way possible. And if you've had kids, you know there were times you said yes because that was the best thing for them. You know there were times you said no because it was the best thing for them. Right? But He always responds in love. 
and his generosity means, and his power means he can respond to you in amazing, loving ways. If you ask. If you ask. Some of you folks, you're wondering why God's not giving you things. And God gave you the Sears catalog and gave, turned you to the toy section. And you said, no, I'm not going to pick anything. You wonder why you ended up with a Barbie Jeep. He wants you to ask. Matter of fact, he wants you to ask so much. And here's the third point. Our prayers have real impact. God moves through our prayers. There are things God is planning to do, God wants to do, and he will not do them until you ask. It is a strange, strange thing that I cannot understand. That the sovereign, all-powerful God of the universe is waiting on me for certain things to happen. And not just things in my life. They could be praying for somebody else for the things in their lives. I, th I am, uh, and I'll talk about more with this probably next week, but I am c continuously amazed at how God answers my prayers. I shouldn't be, but I, because it, there's an example that I can't tell you about because it's very specific to a certain individual. But they needed something. They were going into a situation, and I, and I kind of just said off the cuff, what you need is this. This is what you need. For, and it was an odd thing. It wasn't like, it, it was not your normal thing. I said, you need this. And I put it on my prayer list. I'm going to start praying for them, for this specific thing. Two weeks. Two weeks it happened. And I don't know if this is the case, but there are times in your life and there are times in the lives of the people around you where God is waiting for you to pray, where God is waiting for you and some other people to pray, where God is waiting for you to be in the process by praying. By, Carson says, by this God-appointed means, by prayer, I become an instrument to bring about a God-appointed end. God has plans that are on hold until you pray. And if that doesn't just stun you a little bit, I don't think I'm going to stun you today. There are things God wants to do in your life and things God wants to do in the world, and he is waiting for us to ask. So maybe, just maybe, we should pray. Matter of fact, the author of Hebrews, let me read it to you and then I'll explain it to you says this so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God stop if you've been a Christian for a while you've heard that verse that's an incredible verse for us it doesn't mean much because we're not even sure what the throne of our gracious God is this book was Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians Jews knew what the throne of God was the throne of God was the place okay let's get the temple sorry I got to give you a whole temple lesson there's the temple of God at that point in Jerusalem. I think this is written before it was collapsed. Either way, there's the temple. And the temple got more and more restrictive as you moved in. Anybody could get into the outer part. Then it got, you had to meet more qualifications. And then in the very middle was the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies was where they thought, where they believed, where was the throne of God. That was God's seat. The throne is where God's, where the king sits. Well, the king, God, sat on the throne in their view in the throne in what was called the holy of holies within the temple and we got what you need to understand is nobody went there boldly ever the high priest was allowed to go in there one time a year and he went with trepidation because if he did anything wrong he would die so when they said the throne of grace god's gracious throne I've killed three batteries today. Nobody would consider who read this going boldly into the throne. Nobody. Not an option. But he says, come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. Come boldly. 
ask God for what you need. Come boldly, desiring to be in his presence. That's what he's calling us to do in prayer. And if you're like most people that I know, you've got a ways to go, including me. I come to his presence frequently, but I need work. That's why we do 21 days of prayer, because all of us need to keep moving. All of us need to go. We need to get to the point where we are coming boldly into the throne of grace. We are asking God to work. We are expecting him to work. We're treating him like the holy, loving, heavenly father that he is. And I think I mentioned this already. Not The kids are doing a similar thing. My wife wrote curriculum for the kids. I, I, I did all the curriculum for the grown-ups. My wife and those kids wrote the curriculum for the kids for this whole next few weeks. And their stuff kind of aligns with what we're doing here. Matter of fact, they have a handout that will have some of the, a couple of the same things on it that you guys learned today. And l- let, me, let me go through this really quick. Because we, we say this is, if you're going to grow, this is the base startup. Three times, a, three times a week, you have a daily time with God. Okay, that's a minimum number, I know, but three times is a start. Where you're getting to get every day, or at least three times a week, you're getting up, you're reading the Bible, reading something devotional probably, and you're praying. Okay? We say you should be in a worship service at least twice a month, and you should go to a connection group at least once a month. Let me challenge you with something different if you have anybody in your household. This week, I want you to do a home connection group. Everybody in your household, bring them together and use whatever day of the week it is from the 21 Days of Prayer booklet. And bring, if you have a kid, bring their handout and work together through the two things together and do a family connection group this week. Where you talk about prayer, where you pray together. Can I say this? Where some of these kids get to hear dad pray. Where some of these kids get to hear mom pray. Because if you're like a lot of places, your kid may never hear you pray except for grace for meals. The only pray they may hear from you is bless this food. Let your kids hear you pray for meaningful things. And I'm challenging it. This, this is, this is, I know this is a challenge for a lot of people. Find a time to get all the kids in one room before everybody goes to sleep. That may not be easy. I didn't say it was easy. I said it was worthwhile. And if it's just the two of you in the house, at least once this week, at least once this week, get together and go through this. Even better if you do it multiple times as a couple. Because, see, God wants you to pray, which means you you need to do it. God wants you in his presence, which means you need to do it often enough and well enough and persistently enough that you're not just reciting something to him, but you're actually praying. Praying that you're in his presence. And God wants you to take the important things in your life and bring them to him, the important things in your world, and bring them to him. That's what we're working on for these next three weeks. We're all trying to get better. Nobody's perfect, but we all want to get better. And so I challenge you, join us this, this next three weeks. I promise you, if you do this, not because... There's anything magical about the way we do it, but just the fact that we do it. Your faith is going to grow over the next three weeks. Okay? Your relationship with God is going to grow over the next three weeks. If you're a follower of Christ, you're going to grow as you pray better. Does that make sense? Now, every service, when I finish my sermon, I, I do what? Now, I pray. Let me tell you something. I don't do it because I'm supposed to. I don't do it because it gives them a chance to move the screen back. Although they do that. I do it because I believe God is waiting to do certain things for me to ask. And when I pray, I believe God listens and God moves. Not because I'm special. Because he said so. So when I, when I conclude my sermon with prayer, it's not a ritual. It's me interceding for you before God and asking him to do, 
very real things in your life. I, I have no desire to go through the motions of preaching to you. I want you more like Jesus. I want you to grow to become the person he created you to be. And when I pray for you, I pray because I believe he hears and I believe he answers. So now that you understand what's about to happen, let's pray. Father, thank you for prayer. Thank you for the privilege of coming boldly into your presence. Thank you for the fact that you want us to pray, you listen when we pray, you act when we pray. And Father, for every person in this room, help us to pray. Help us to pray faithfully. Help us to pray frequently. Help it to be a part of our lives. Father, for the person who is struggling to just get started with prayer, maybe they got a few kids in the house and life is hectic and finding those few moments is challenging. Help them to find the few moments this week. Father, for the couple that's struggling, help them to come to you together this week, knowing that as they grow closer to you, they'll invariably grow closer to each other. Father, I, I pray for the people that are alone this week, the ones who, when I talk about praying with your family, there's nobody home but them. Keep them encouraged. Keep them with the friendships they need outside their home. Father, for each of us, help us to pray like it matters. Help us to pray like you're listening because you are. And help us to pray like you change the world through our prayers because you do. And it's in Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen.